Hey everyone, my name is Marla and I'm so very happy you're here joining me for a video teaching going along with my website injesusname.net. If you go over there and subscribe for free, you can get my videos and the blog posts sent to you. It's free, like I said, and please feel free to subscribe as I'm teaching through the Bible cover to cover. For today's video, I don't know that I've ever been so excited to say something in my whole life, but I get to say this week we are moving into the new testament in our study it has been months and months and months of studying the old testament and now we are getting ready to head into the new testament this week and uh, hopefully be able to see it with fresh new eyes because of what we've put in place in over these months of studying the old testament now i am i'm going to admit to you though i'm excited to say to you that we're going into the new testament just because we've done so much hard work for me, leaving the Old Testament is actually very sad. I enjoy studying the Old Testament more, I guess, than studying the New Testament. And so, though, you know, I'm a bit sad about moving into the New Testament in that way, I am happy that um, I'll be able to maybe connect everybody a little bit more to how the New Testament really just highlights everything that we've already learned in the Old Testament. So I'm thrilled. Um, for us and uh, for today what I want to do is just put everything in a little context because in this time period in between the Old Testament and the New Testament there's actually 400 years and some people don't realize that that there is a big blank in there of years and a lot of people call them the silent years because nothing is said and I I, I want to say and those of you who've been studying that's really not the truth there there has been something said about the 400 years between the last words spoken in the Old Testament and the first words spoken in the New Testament and you can find that detail in Daniel chapter 11 now this is one of those chapters that is just full of of prophecies but you really have to do some digging to uncover um, how they specifically applied and when I say applied it's because what it's already happened in this 400 year time period that is known as the silent years if you go to Daniel chapter 11 and take a look it is going to detail for you what happens during the reign of Alexander the Great and then his subsequent demise and then how his kingdom his empire was divided into four and in those 400 years the empire is just fighting amongst itself these four different wings of the Greek Empire are fighting amongst themselves and vying for power and it's just a whole big civil war mess and so that is all detailed in Daniel chapter 11 and so these years are not silent there it's it's all right in there um, but where we left and you know how most people Kind of think okay i'm left with this kind of cliffhanger um, where we left the story of the old testament we know that god had promised his people the jewish people a promised land and in deuteronomy 28 we found out that if the jewish people followed god's laws and uh, remained faithful to him they could stay in the promised land and be abundantly blessed but if they didn't, if they were disobedient, if they started following other, other gods, small g gods, then what God was going to do was kick them out of the promised land. And unfortunately, that is exactly what happened. We go through periods of judges and then kings and then, you know, everything is just spiraling downhill to the point where the first kingdom to get kicked out of the promised land is the northern part of the of the Israelite kingdom they get kicked out in 722 BC by the Assyrians and then the southern part of the the land of promised land of Israel they get kicked out in 586 BC by the Babylonians and then eventually um, Babylon is taken over by Persia and all the while the Jewish people are in captivity so 70 years God said for 70 years he was going to judge them for being disobedient and kick them out of the promised land and so where we leave the Old Testament the the people uh, Persia has taken over and the the first king of Persia he starts to let some Israelites back to the promised land because 
you know, in God's economy, the 70 years is over. And so the Persian king is stirred to start letting people to go back into the promised land, the Israelite people. And so they rebuild the temple, they rebuild the walls, they're building up. But what you need to know was um, that captivity was the worst thing that ever happened to the Jewish people. God had promised them this promised land and they're, and they're kicked out and they're dispersed among the globe. The Persian Empire was huge and vast. And part of what the Persians did, would they, they would really take people out of their country and then assimilate them into different countries, teach everybody the Persian way, integrate cultures. And in that way, the Persian way sort of spread to everywhere. And so the Jewish people, when you say they were in captivity, they were spread all over the Persian Empire, which was vast. And so when King Darius started letting people come back into the Promised Land, into Israel, um, not everybody came back. You know, 70 years is a really long time. And so some people had been established in whatever nation they wound up in, uh, Egypt or, or, or Macedonia or whatever. You know, their families were there, their businesses were there, they were happy there. And so, though it was open for them to go back, they couldn't travel back or they didn't want to travel back. And so, yes, Israel was becoming populated again by Jewish people, but it was never, ever, ever repopulated to the size that it was um, before the captivities. Uh, tons and millions of people were killed. Uh, only a very few, couple thousand people were taken into captivity. And so there was very few people going back who were Jewish and um, it was just a struggle. And so, like I said, this captivity was the worst thing that ever happened and many, many people stayed out there dispersed among the other nations. It's called the diaspora. They're dispersed out there, Jewish people all over the place, some coming back but never built up again. And Israel, is a, is a vassal state, it's a client state, which means that there is no Jewish king really reigning over Israel. Um, that's part of the Davidic covenant that was, there was going to be somebody from the line of David ruling from Jerusalem forever. But in this time, you have some governors that have been put in place and um, they're ruling, but they're, they're ruling on behalf of another nation. The people of Israel are paying taxes to these other nations. They are not under their own governance. And so you, you do need to realize that Israel, though it's a country now, that only just happened in 1948. From the time of the captivity, when Judah was kicked out there by the Babylonians taking them to captivity, that was 586 BC. So that is nearly 2000 years that Israel was not its own country and it was not being ruled by Jewish people. It was just being, um, it was just paying taxes really to other nations. And like I said, in the 400 years, that was, that was the Greek empire. They came and they took over for Persia. Then they were all infighting. And then the Roman empire came and took over they took over the Greek Empire. And so when we open the New Testament, the Roman Empire is in control of Israel. There are people that have come back and they're living there. But you also have to know at the end of the Greek Empire, there was an, an awful, awful, awful emperor. His name was um, Antiochus Epiphanes and he was from the Seleucid dynasty. That was part of the Greek Empire. And when he was in control of Israel, he murdered, you know, two thirds of the population that what that had come back and they too scattered whoever was left. And so it was just, there was, there was not a lot of Jewish people when Rome took over and um, they were living there under Roman rule, paying taxes to Rome. And that is how the books of the New Testament open. And we see it right off the bat that a man named Herod the Great he is in control. He's a governor over Jerusalem and Judea. And the Jewish people are paying taxes to Rome and they're under Roman rule. And that is the setting for the New Testament. And so we, you know, you're in this place where you're like, oh, the Jewish people, they're, 
dispersed all over. They, they, they are not even in control in their own land. They're being oppressed. The Jewish people are waiting for the Messiah that has been predicted in the Old Testament. They, they, they think that this new Messiah is going to come and kick out Rome. They're waiting for, for somebody to come and bring Israel back under control of a Jewish king from the line of David. And so when we get into the New Testament, you're going to see that struggle playing out because Jesus doesn't come looking like what the Jewish people think he should look like, which is conquering king to come and vanquish Rome and bring peace and the Jewish state back into, into being. And so that is where the trouble lies. And more than that, the trouble lies in the fact that these Jewish people that have missed Jesus as that conquering king, it's because they missed the many, many prophecies about Jesus first coming to be savior of the world. And the way that he did that was by first being humble servant who died on the cross. And so you'll see places all over the Old Testament where it's prophesied that he was going to first come to be pierced, uh, hang on the cross is what that means, and to serve and to you know to be cut off that's all pointing to the fact that the the king that was coming to israel first was going to die in order that he could wipe out the sins of the world and um and and thereby have it so that the world could could be uh, given a an entrance into heaven because they would have no more sin so it wouldn't matter if jesus had come and wiped out rome because people were still going to die in their sins and go to hell and not heaven. And so Jesus' first task was to give away a permanent way that people could be cleansed of sin. And he was going to do that by being the sacrifice. He was going to sacrifice himself on the cross, humble servant first, and then conquering king later. And so... What I want to share just today in, in closing is really the worst possible thing that ever happened to Israel, like I said, is, is them being taken into captivity, ripped out of the promised land, um, absolutely being persecuted because of other nations being in control of them, um, them not having their own king, and, and really all of this is a judgment from God. Um, really up until today, it's still that same judgment that lays on the nation of Israel for rejecting him, first God, and then his Messiah. Uh, when Jesus came, he said himself, I came to the Jews. I came to present myself as king. But they reject him and they say, no, our only king is Caesar. And so in that moment, again, the, the Jewish nation were, were really setting themselves up for judgment from God, um, being kicked out of their land, and, and thereby this is the state that they're in now. They're in that same place. Even though Israel now is a country and Jewish people are starting to come back, there are still millions of Jewish people scattered around the globe. And they are not back in Israel and they don't want to go back to Israel, and they don't believe in God, and they certainly don't believe in Jesus. And so there is still this scattering of the Jewish people who still claim that they're Jewish in heritage. They still say, I'm part, I'm Jewish. So they'll, they'll claim their national identity as Jewish, but they live in America, or they live in Germany, or they live in Russia. They don't live in Israel. So there's still this diaspora going on, this spread out of Jewish people. There's still a national judgment going on against Israel by God for rejecting him. And so um, this was going on during the, during the Roman Empire. There were pockets of Jewish people everywhere, and, um, and it was a bad situation in Israel. But I want to show you how this, has, this was used for incredible good, like everything with God, the worst possible thing in your life, in my life, God can still use for great good. And so after Jesus died and he uh, um, was resurrected and ascended, his message really was to go and spread this gospel about him, the good news about him, to the world. To go and make followers, make disciples of him, let that message spread everywhere. And 
we see as we get into the New Testament, there's four books that speak about Jesus' life, the Gospels, and then one book called the Book of Acts, which is a history of how this got accomplished to where we are today, where there's billions and billions of Christ followers on the planet. How did it go from 12 guys on a mountain to billions of people out there following Christ? And the way that it happened mainly is through the the efforts of the apostles and particularly Paul and you'll see it in the book of Acts where Paul goes out and he starts to bring the gospel to the pagan nations the nations outside of Israel um, to share with them what Jesus told them to share that he's the Messiah believe in him he died for them he can they can be cleansed of sin and they can go into heaven and so as we start to read the book of Acts, you're going to see that Paul's first thing that he did was he would go to the temples or the pockets of Jewish people that were out there in the nations and preach to them first because these people had a knowledge of the one true God because they had studied the Old Testament, the, the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. And so as you read in the book of Acts, I want you to realize that the worst possible thing in the world that happened to the Jewish people turned into the best possible thing in the world for the spread of the gospel. Because these Jewish people were spread across the nations, Paul had some place to go to speak to people who had some idea about a one true God. And though he was rejected many times in these places, his first go was, I'm gonna to go to the Jewish people out there and talk to them about Messiah and some would believe and they would start little churches little ecclesias little group gatherings of people that believed in Jesus out there in the nations and then eventually Paul he said you know what the Jewish people don't want to hear this so much I'm gonna to go to the people who aren't Gentile and talk to them but you need to know that even those Gentile people they had an idea in their mind that there was such a thing as this one God that these Jewish people believe in because they were Jewish people living among them out there in the nations because they were dispersed because of the captivities, because of the diaspora. And so all of this was absolutely to plan that God allowed this judgment to come to the Jewish nation so they could be dispersed across all the globe so that when the time came, when the gospel message had to go to the globe, that there were people there ready to receive the fact that Jesus was the one they were waiting for, the Messiah. And many, many did. And that is how Christianity spread throughout the world. It was because there were all these people already out there that had an idea that he was supposed to come. And just like today, some people latch onto the idea and they say, oh, I see it. He is who we were waiting for. And some people don't. And that's just, that's the way the gospel spreads. And um, meanwhile, we as Christ followers are supposed to be lights out there to Christ out in the nations. And we're just looking for people um, who God leads us to that we can tell the same thing that Paul was telling, uh, Jesus died for your sins and he was buried and he rose from the grave. And because of that, we can know that everything he said was true. Only God can predict his own death and then pull it off and then resurrect and walk around and tell people about it. So if Jesus did that, if he resurrected and showed himself for 40 days, the Bible said to lots of people, um, if he pulled that off, then everything that he said in his words was absolutely true as as shared with us by the gospel messages and what Jesus said about himself is I am the way I am the truth I am the life nobody comes to the Father except through me so that is the message that Jesus wants everybody to know that there's a way to get to the Father in heaven and it's through the sacrifice of himself of Jesus on the cross for the remissions of sins so that you can stand in front of the Father and say, I'm not here by my own merit. I'm here because Jesus died for me and he took my sin on his body. And because Jesus did that for me, he took your wrath onto him, I can stand here and not be judged as, as wicked as a sinner. 
And so it's called the Great Exchange. That's what Jesus did for you and I on the cross, and that's the message that we as Christ followers are to bring to the whole world as stated by Jesus in his Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make make followers of me and, um, and, and share the gospel to the globe. Okay, so I hope that sets you up a little bit for the New Testament and it lets you see that God's great plan for the Jewish people, it's not over yet. Um, they're still under his, his judgment, but we when we get to the book of Revelation, we are going to see that God never, ever, ever has given up on the Jewish people. And even though the, the, the judgment is still happening and it gets worse for the Jewish people, he is still... He is going to show himself to the Jewish nation. He is going to show himself as conquering king. When he comes back in the second coming, coming, the Jewish nation, they are going to see him like it was his first time coming, the way that they want to see him, conquering king. Because when he comes for the second coming, he is absolutely going to take out the wicked, oppressive nations which are clobbering the Jewish people and Christians in the end days. So um, it's all coming to a crescendo and the Jewish people are never ever going to be left and forgotten by God. His promises to them have not yet been fulfilled. And so God is not done with the Jewish people and he's not done yet gathering up the Gentile people. And so God's got, got some work to do. But I want to say to you, you've got to keep looking up because he can come back and rapture the church of believers at any time. And so you want to be ready for him to come and take away the bride, the church. And uh, we're going to read about how that happens when we get more and more into our New Testament study. So stick with me, and I'll see you next time. And I thank you so much for joining me. And it's in Jesus' name. I'm doing it all. See you next time. Bye now.